talk about these kind of behaviors, growl, bark, snap, lunge, and bite, without labeling the dog that does them. Because as soon as we say that Rudy is aggressive, nobody wants to adopt him and nobody wants to be around him. And if we say Rudy's reactive, we may not get the right idea about what he does because we can say reactive and we can say aggressive and we can say challenging and we can say hard to handle and we can say Rottweiler-esque. <laughs> but um, ultimately what I want to talk about is what is it that they're feeling and what is it that they're doing, not what are we going to call it. But it's okay to ask those kind of questions, don't be shy about it. But if I seem stilted in what I'm saying, that's why. <laughs> I've never done a two hour presentation without using those words before, and it makes it a lot harder. Why do our dogs act this way? It's usually a combination of factors, not one thing, and it's important to know that we don't have to know why. We know what to do. But the cause does matter if the cause is continuing. That's when it matters. So part of it's always gonna be a predisposition that is just genetics, which can include events occurring to either parent, which is called epigenetics, and by the way, was considered hocus pocus 30 years ago. Um, 30 years ago, people talked about this stuff and they were ostracized and made fun of, and now not only do we know it's true, we even know how it works. When I say we, I mean people smarter than myself, but I, I believe them. Lack of exposure or inappropriate exposure, that is, um, sometimes we might call that lack of socialization or inappropriate uh, socialization, but that's another word that means different things to different people. And ultimately, welcome, come on in. What we're talking about is exposing our dogs to things when they're younger so that they get these experiences and then they're not afraid of them later. But how many of those experiences that they have, and most importantly, the nature of the experiences and when is a critical part of this formula that is different for different individuals. So we have to be thinking about, have they been exposed to these things and was the exposure appropriate? Flooding is another reason. Many dogs are fine up to a point and then it's just too much. Um, I've been teaching him how to swim in a swimming pool. He already knew how to swim and he already knew how to walk downstairs but walking down the stairs in the swimming pool was a big problem. And it was hard for me to understand that it wasn't the stairs he was afraid of and it wasn't the water he was afraid of, it was that moment of coming off the stairs. But if we had just pulled him right in right away, then the fear that he felt from coming off the stairs could have then been including the pool and the people and me and everything else around us. So we have to be careful when and flooding doesn't only mean that we're working with water, it just means what we're working with. And then traumatic events and single event learning, unfortunately, is a real thing that can happen, good or bad, but is more likely to happen with bad things. So one really bad experience as perceived by the subject can cause a lifetime of trouble. People that live with dogs like these we have to recognize that it's really hard on us. And I wish that I had been kinder to myself earlier in working with a dog like this, that if you live with a dog like this and you find that you are frustrated, resentful, if, hi <laughs> Frank, if you then feel guilty because you felt resentful, uh, I think that that's normal. I think that when we live with dogs that, that act like this, that it's, it's, we have to be kind to ourselves and whatever that means to you. I think it means different things to different people, but the main, I think, thing we have to worry about is what's going on in our own head. I, I in the same 30 seconds, have been resentful, felt guilty about being resentful, gotten down on myself for feeling guilty. You know, we're doing what we can. So this is a trick question, which I don't like, so I'm going to answer it for you right here. What is the first behavior we must change to help our dogs? Yeah, our own behavior, right? I work with people every day on this stuff, and it is normal, and I'm not criticizing people, it's a normal part of the process to figure out, gosh, I'm gonna to have to change a lot of things about my life in order to change things about their lives. And that's something we have to come to grips with. So 
So what do barking, growling, lunging, air snapping, and biting all have in common? This feeling for sure, stress. Because some of this is gonna be about things that have worked for them in the past. Some of this is gonna be about frustration. Some of it's gonna be about fearfulness. But it all comes back to this one. And some stress is a normal part of a living organism's response to the inevitable changes. Some levels are even beneficial, right? We have to experience stress in order to learn. That's how it works. So in no way am I saying that our dog should just live in a pink room with you know beautiful smells and sounds all the time. They have to be exposed to these things. And stress is how they learn, and it's how we learn. But the reduction of it, the thoughtful presentation of it, the, the, the getting through it in a way that is ultimately productive is the critical part of this. And going back to what we used to not understand and now we do is that when animals are under stress, all kinds of other things happen. Their uh, immune systems are weakened. Their likelihood of being upset tomorrow is increased. They're more vulnerable to some kinds of diseases. And so dogs that are spend a whole lot of time doing these behaviors are probably spending a whole lot of time being under this. And it's gonna affect everything, not just one thing. As I said in the beginning, I'm really uncomfortable with labels. The more I do this, the more I have to remind myself to stay away from it. But having been said, thinking in terms of categories can be helpful, it helps me. And this is how I think about it. And it would be easy to say, well, yeah, but what about, I know, there's always a what about. But this is how I think about it, and maybe it'll help you. The two major categories that I think about are, what has the dog learned through what has worked for them in the past? Whether it's because he jumped on me and I pet him and said, good boy, thanks for jumping on me. Or because he jumped on me and I left the room or because he was scared of somebody and barked at them and they left, right? That's a very effective way of learning what to do. Um, or worse, he barked at somebody and it didn't work, so then he lunged at them and that worked, right? So we have to be thinking in terms of history of consequences or what behavioral psychologists call operant learning. And the other one, and equally as important, probably more so, is emotional reactions. So that would include, and it only includes this one when this happens, fearfulness when attempting to leave has failed. The term you hear a lot would be fearful aggression. And I think more and more of us are realizing that fearful aggression is actually not a real thing. Biologically speaking, fearful animals will leave if they can, unless there's a resource that they can't leave behind. But when they can't leave, when they're cornered, or leashed, or held down, then those things aren't leaving, aren't working, and so the next thing occurs. Uh, rage is a real thing. It's a real emotion, and, and, and we see evidence of it. Resource guarding is usually considered a form of fearfulness. It's a biological uh, fear of not having enough stuff, whatever it is, shelter, comfort, food, most obvious one. And emotional reactions are going to involve the system that is involuntary. That is to say, even if I solve these, if their blood pressure is still going up and their eyes are still dilating and their hair still stands up, their paws still sweat, they still drool, even if I solve this temporarily and those things are still going on, we're gonna get back to here soon, probably worse. So we can suppress behavior, but if we don't solve the emotional part, It'll come back. I can learn how to control myself when angry, but please stop making me mad as well. You know, Please stop making me sad. I can think about sad things and not cry, but not all day. Hi, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. And by the way, I just broke a cardinal rule of being a good dog trainer, right? I just used an example. Humans and dogs are very different, and it's a big mistake to try to compare them like that. In this one instance, how emotions are experienced, even that isn't quite right. We don't know how they experience emotion. But we do know that when they're afraid, their heart rate goes up, their blood pressure goes up, their eyes dilate, their hair stands up, they need to get dry mouth or wet mouth, and all these different things that they cannot control and they can't change through history of learning about consequences. Those things are not within the voluntary range of action.
Questions about that? It's a really important thing to understand, even if you don't understand it completely, which I don't either. Yes? Do you remember that bottom left one? The bottom left? Major prior solution is? Reinforcing different behavior adequately and appropriately. So we want to use training at a low level of different differentiation and then use distance. So what that means is, is if I don't want my dog to bark and lunge at dogs, and I'm going to try and solve this in some way, I have to be aware of this part, then what I want to do is train him to do something different. So, and I want to do it at a distance at which we can be successful. When there are stressors, and we call them triggers, it changes what the dog is capable of learning. They'll be so upset that they can't learn. And there will be some range at which, maybe it's a thousand feet, maybe it's a hundred feet, maybe it's ten feet, and we'll see some videos later about this, where the dog is able to learn appropriately, but is still experiencing the stress of the trigger. And that's our little learning sweet spot. So what do we do and how do we do it? Being a certified professional dog trainer through the Certification Council of Dog Trainers, I am committed to doing this, that is following the humane hierarchy or better. And what that means is, is and it can be something major like kneeing them, hitting them, kicking them, etc. So this is the general format. This is the framework of which we have to be thinking about when we start to try to change these behaviors. And then when it's time to do the work, how's your dog feeling right now? How's your dog feeling an hour ago? How are they feeling yesterday? Because if on the way in here, this would never happen here, I'm just saying, if on the way in here, odd people had run up and hit my dog, or if dogs had come out of nowhere and attacked him, then I'd have to have a serious conversation with myself, is this the right day to bring him in here with all of these strangers, right? We have to look at what's going on in the moment with your dog before we start our training session. Are they ready to learn in an effective and appropriate and humane way? Because if they're not, we have to be willing to just not do it that day or not that hour or whatever. Any questions about that? We see this one not happening right all the time all around us. People, we decide, all right, well, we're going to take our dog for a walk. You step out the door and the dog says, I don't want to go for a walk. We say, yeah, you do. <laughs> well, we haven't changed how they feel about the walk. We've changed how they feel about us, not for the better, right? And they may or may not walk with us that time, but over time, there will be an effect of this. And maybe the effect will be that they get used to it and they'll just always go for a walk with you. Or maybe they'll come to be afraid of you or afraid of going outside or who knows. There's all kinds of associations that are made all the time with these things. The reason that it matters how they felt an hour ago and how they were feeling yesterday is that these things build up and build up. They have bad days, they have bad weeks, and it takes them longer, we think, to come down from a bad day than it does us. I can reflect, I can think, I can pray, I can meditate, I can drink wine, marijuana is legal, I can talk it over with my wife and my clergy or whatever. All dogs can do is wait it out. They can't do any of that. Next is, do you have a plan? And, and this doesn't mean do you have a written plan, it doesn't have to be in writing, it just means I can walk, you know, if you say, can you help me teach my dog to sit? Yes, I have a plan for that. We've done that before. I know what the plan is. It's okay. Does your plan include emotional and physical safety for all species? Are you going to work with dogs that are likely to bite you? Do you have a plan for conditioning them to a muzzle first? We have to look at safety for us, too. And that includes emotional. Are you in an emotional place today to work with a dog that may bite somebody? I, I, I am not always. There are days I just don't have it. According to our plan, how are the dog's feelings going to change? And do we know why? If we don't, start, start over, figure it out, know in advance. And how will the dog's behavior change and why? <coughs> and it's okay if your understanding of this is, well, I talked it over with a professional trainer and I have a general sense. That's fine. I mean, you know, if you're not taking money from people, that's fine. You do have a plan, even if I wrote the plan. You do have a plan, even if Dr. Friedman wrote the plan or somebody else like that. You have a sense of what's going on. The reason that I, that I mention this part is that there was a time when I felt very intimidated by these steps because I thought, well, I don't, 
I don't have a master's degree in behavioral psychology. I don't necessarily understand every aspect of it. I'm not saying that. You have to have a broad picture. So, one of the most common reasons for this sort of behavior is resource guarding. And um, here's some just some quick information. Resource guarding is normal. It's not necessarily aberrant or weird. It's how extreme it is. So when we start to think about, is it aberrant or something we have to address? If you have multiple animals in your household and they eat in the same room and one of them wanders over to the other one's bowl and that one goes, there, that is resource guarding and I would say, <laughs> Good communication as well, and totally appropriate. So that's not something I would try to change. Now, if your dog is eating by themselves and a child walks into the house two rooms away and the dog sees the child and charges them, well, I would say we should really work on that a lot. So we have to consider what is within the range of acceptable. And I think that unfortunately, we have moved in the wrong direction on this. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Resource guarding, if it's Again, if it's considered aberrant, is not related to quantity of nearby resources. You can have 100 balls, but if you try to take that dog's ball, he'll fight. It doesn't matter how many balls are in the room or how much food there is. And that's important because too often the strategy becomes, well, I'll show the dog there's plenty, and when that doesn't work, you blame the dog. It won't work, so that can't be it. Resource guarding is often called uh, something about being spoiled, and that's just not the case. It is within the range of normal, and then they learn something about what happens next. It is an emotional and predictable emotional reaction that is built in biologically as part of survival for the animal. So to work on it, we should work below our dog's threshold. That means that we work on it in a time, place, and with items that are not causing the dog to immediately bark, snap, lunge, growl. We want to work below that level. First step is trade back and forth. Teach your dog to give you items by giving them something else that's better. And as you practice that over and over and over and over, even if once or twice or 10 times the thing isn't better, they'll still do it. That's called dog training. That's what happens. Using rewards to change behavior does not, uh, does not necessarily cause a, a need for those rewards to be present in the moment. It's, it's a general learning process. Practice adding reward uh, resources, not taking them away. So a classic example of this is when I was a kid, I was taught to handle this by taking the dog's food and punishing them if they protested. And I'm old enough that I did that a lot. And that, for many dogs, it works and that the dog doesn't care that much about it in the first place, so they just learn not to say anything. But for some dogs, it just teaches them to ramp it up and be stronger and more forceful, right? So instead, though, if you want your dog to be comfortable with you moving around their food, if you set the bowl down and you walk up and add food to it, and you step back and they start to eat and you add more food, more food to it, then people approaching their bowl has a history of being something good, and then they don't get so upset about it. I'm not saying do that and then start taking their food. I'm saying don't mess with dogs while they're eating, but this is how we reduce their level of reaction when it does occur. And finally, use smart management to avoid problems with family or guests. You know, I have worked with people who were having a party and fed their dog like normal. I always feed my dog this way, but you don't because you don't usually have 20 people in your kitchen. And then the dog bites somebody because they're not used to that event and it gets all out of control. So, be smart about it and be willing to feed your dog someplace else or some other time or something else if the situation is not appropriate. Yes? What about guarding not from people but from another dog? It's, it's the same. Dog. I mean, we would change it the same way. Obviously, we don't teach the dog to walk up and put food in their bowl. Right. Mm -hmm. But what we would do is something like, um, I had to go through this with my cats, right? Is that so if the dog is eating and the cat comes into the room, bacon's added to his food. Cats coming into the room is not such a terrible thing, right? And so these associations are made, and it would be better if the cat could do it, but I'm not that good a cat trainer. <laughs> that was a really good question. There. And resources, by the way, are not necessarily food. It's the most obvious one, but it's also toys. people, toys, locations. Um, I, 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 here's an opinion. Most of what I talk about is 
peer-reviewed fact, but here's an opinion. Balls have no business being at dog parks. Dog parks are for dogs to socialize with other dogs, and if what you want to do is play fetch with your dog, then go someplace where there aren't other dogs. They're just going to interfere with the game. Fetch is a one dog, one human game. And you might have two dogs to play well together. Fine. I, I applaud that. Way to go. Take them someplace and play fetch. But so many dog park problems happen because people are trying to do something that's a one dog activity, and then they're, the dog and the human are both offended when they, they interfere with it. So yes, it can be anything. I don't want to spend too much time on this because we could easily spend two hours talking about balls and fetch. But fetch is a, an innate behavior in many dogs. It's called a motor action pattern. And what that means is they don't have to learn how to do it, and they don't need a reward other than the game. Humans have no such activity as adults. There's nothing that we can do that feels that way for us. So we can't really understand it. Sex doesn't count. You can do that for a little while. But, you know. but fetch, it just gets better and better and better and better and better. And the more that they do it, the more powerful it becomes to the point that then people will say, well, my dog isn't really food motivated. They just want their ball. That's a mental health crisis that's been created. And that's not healthy. In humans, what do we call that? Yeah, yeah it's, it's not healthy. So fetch is fine. It's good. Any of those kind of innate behaviors are fine. A little bit. Some. But if your dog has a stronger history of reward for scuffing their back paws than they do for taking food from your hand, there's something that's just not healthy. Scuffing your back paws is just a classic example that's misunderstood, but when dogs get stressed, they will do whichever uh, of these innate behaviors are handy. And one is they'll mount a lot. So sometimes you see dogs do it, and it's like, why is that dog doing that right now? Well, they're stressed out, so they just go grab the pillow. Oh, God, that feels much better. It's not sexual in that instance. It's just, it's built in. Um, I'm going to try to really quickly pull up this video. And, um, there we go. So this is just a, it's a short video about resource guarding that I think might help. Humans have this idea you hear that? that we should be able to take their stuff whenever we want. And I think that's a very old fashioned idea and that that shouldn't be what we expect. In fact, I'm not sure that's even old fashioned. It's almost like it's somewhere between new and old fashioned. I don't think that's the way it was like in my grandfather. I don't remember him ever messing with his dog Scooby at all. And I was with him when he fed several different dogs dozens of times. And he always just told me to stay away from their food. So I think that's a very reasonable solution. Let the dog eat, leave them alone. But if you've got kids that are running around or you really want to you know, really work extra on it, then what I do is, is I just take their dish, whether it's a puzzle dish or a regular dish, and I show them the food and I put it in it. And while they're working on it, I put in some more. So it's not this thing where we're going to put a bunch of food in there and then take it out. Uh, and then you know punish them if they growl at us or something. It's that we really want to teach them that our hands near their stuff or us near them while they eat whatever it is that they're eating is a good thing for them. So I want to point out that up till now, <coughs> I'm not intentionally in this demonstration teaching him to do anything in particular. I'm just trying to change how he feels. A little bit in a second here, you'll start to see me teaching him what to do. <clears throat> but first I want him to feel generally okay, and we've worked on this a lot, this is a demonstration, but I want him to feel generally okay about him having a bone and him eating food and me sitting there with him. So that he's not, just as soon as you come near being defensive, you can, I think you can see he's, I'm sure he'd be happier if I just leave him alone, but he's not under great distress. Yes, I saw a couple questions. Does he know that this is him? <laughs> <laughs> to the best of our ability to read this information, dogs are not capable of doing that. Yes. Go ahead. Well, I was just wondering, maybe you could do it in the video. If it's a, um, if he's chewing a bone, uh -huh. I mean, you're not going to keep adding another bone. So how would you do that, you know, if it's not something that's in small pieces that you can right. just keep adding? Well, you start with this. Okay. So that us generally doing this feel good, feels good. And then we can think, is there anything better than a bone that we could trade him for? Sort of depends upon the dog, right? But almost, usually there's something better. 
but it doesn't have to be, right, it depends, right? But it doesn't have to be better in that moment. That's a common thing that you hear that's not, it just means that it's not understood. For instance, Rudy, sit. Good dog. Rudy, down. Good, wait. Good. All right, go to bed. So the fact that I trained him to do those things with food doesn't mean I need to give him food right now. And it's the same with this stuff. We've done this enough times that I don't have to trade him something better every time if most of the time in the past I have, or if however many number it is, and it's different always how many times it takes, but I've done it enough times that even if I'm trading him for nothing, it'll still go okay at least a few times, or at least once, I hope. <laughs> But there are ways that you can do it. Said, well, you can go into eating right. murder condition, it's less than meat. Um, but this is a good way to practice this um, to help them not have an issue with Thanks, Brian. Fear. I'll say something like, um, Rudy, eat it. Good boy. So he left it. I rewarded him. I took his book. Yeah, that's me, buddy. I've got it right here, okay? Just one second. I know. That's so there, in the past, I had taught him something to do, right? I tell him to leave it, he looks away from the thing, I reward him for looking away. He didn't see me take it, it would be a better video if he'd seen me take it, but he knows I have it now, and so you can make that together, right? So I've also taught him that he's on his bed to not lunge at me to take his stuff back, because we've done this enough times. He's, now he's getting excited, and to, to answer your question earlier, I'm trying to make the bone better now. Here, here, hold on. I have a little problem with my cat here. Oh, yeah. What if every time somebody messed with your food, the food came back better? <laughs> this kind of stuff. If they get upset, that means that I went too far too fast. I don't need to tell him it's not okay to express himself. I need him to let me know. Um, if he growls, I need to know that. Pat Miller is a very, very famous dog trainer. She's a, published several books and writes for the whole dog journal. And I mean, she kind of sums it up right here. Growling is a gift from a dog. It's a way of saying, I don't want to bite you, but I'm not really, I don't, I don't recognize myself on a TV screen. I don't recognize myself in mirrors. I'm confused. When I fart, I look at my butt like I don't know what happened. <laughs> they don't sit there and make these you know, pathological plans about what they're gonna do next. These are normal, natural reactions that animals have. And growling is a way of saying, I just, I'm not comfortable with this. And our job then is to read that and back off and go, okay, how can I approach this slower or better? Because he's upset so I can back off. Because otherwise, you know, we just end up trying to um, change not how they're feeling. This is trying to change how he's feeling. I'm trying to change how he feels about people coming near his food. What I don't want to do is convince him that he shouldn't express himself when he is upset. Because if he doesn't tell me that he's upset, that's how people get hurt. Shelters are full of are full of dogs whose paperwork says. So here he still has the bone. I don't know if you can see that. It's right there. Mm -hmm. And I'm feeding him peanut butter and let him keep the bone. Right. So me being near him when he has bones does not have any bad history for him. It's all been every time that I've been near him while he had a bone, it's been good stuff. Mm -hmm. Came out better because I was there, not worse. And so now when people, including other people, walk by him, he's just like, is there any peanut butter in this? Room? No, okay, well, I'm busy. <laughs> Instead of, I'm gonna defend myself. Unpredictable. And I think that a lot of those dogs are unpredictable because they've been punished when they were predictable. If you don't know a dog and you see him on the street, if any of you travel to other countries, uh, you know, depending on where they were, many countries have a lot of feral dogs. We have them here too. Um, if you see a feral dog on the street and they have a bone and you come too close to them, can you predict what will happen? Yeah. Me too, right? They'll probably growl. I hope. <laughs> I hope they'll say back off. That's predictable behavior. And when dogs act unpredictably, it's because their predictable behavior has either been ignored or punished. I want him to tell me when he's upset. I want to make it so he's not upset. Yes. So in reality, when a dog does the growl, is it's always good? Is there a time when you, I mean, it's pretty much his way of communicating, so. Well, growling is one example of communicating and they do a lot of these things, right? The lip, 
they lift their lip, they might just stare at you hard, they might look away. Sometimes they'll give you all kinds of appeasing gestures. I had a dog, Frankie, that he never showed any kind of resource guarding in the traditional sense, but if you came too near him, he'd cower. You know, these are all different ways of saying, I'm not comfortable with what's happening. But I mean, the growling thing is a good thing, and you need them to have it, but does it ever become, I mean, you don't want to, like, like when they're jumping on you, you turn around. Yes. When they're growling, it, isn't that positive reinforcement when you when you back off because he's growling, I guess, is what I'm wondering. Is it positive he, reinforcement because you back off because he's growling? Like, okay, I'll, I'll growl all the time then. If that, I mean, are you withdrawing something positive by backing away? Let's, yeah. let's, let's okay. back up for a second. I'm more interested right now in the emotional reaction that we're getting, okay? And I think that the answer, be, the, the, the question becomes, can the dog accidentally be trained to growl on purpose That's what when their emotion isn't one of some kind of fear? And the answer is yeah. If you ever watch TV shows or movies, there's lots of dogs who have been trained to growl on purpose or on cue. You say growl, they go, er, you click and treat, right? And they're not feeling any stress at all. They're feeling anticipation of the joy because they've been trained to do it. So yes, that can be done and it can happen by accident. But that's great. Right. Because if you don't want them to do that, we go back to the main hierarchy and how do you stop a behavior from happening where you try to introduce a different one and or you just make sure that when they growl at you because they want food, you don't give it to them. They'll stop growling at you for food and instead they'll say. So that's a really good question and you're right. That can happen and it does. But what that means when it happens is that their emotional state is one in which they're learning good stuff in their brain, not just, bah, I'm crazy, fearful, scary beast. Now they're actually learning like strategies and stuff, and you can always make there be a better strategy. I will say that uh, his, the other dog that we have is Buster, and he weighs about nine pounds. And, um, oh, I know, I totally forgot to pass these out. Anyway, this is a little drawing of Buster there. Um, and, <laughs> Buster has learned, because I was never too worried about Buster because he's so small, I didn't do a lot of this work, and also he just wasn't, he was good with this stuff with me. But what he'll do is, is he'll walk into the room, look around, and if Rudy's sitting where he wants to sit, I'll walk right up to him and go, and then Rudy will move. <laughs> and that's what you're talking about, and is that a good thing? No, I wish Buster wouldn't do that, and I kind of have to decide if I'm going to work on it or not. So far, I've been like, that's kind of funny, you know, and it's not really dangerous. He's nine pounds, and Buster isn't a dog that I do a lot of social stuff with, so I just, he doesn't do it to anybody but Rudy. So, I'm kind of, I'm kind of okay with it, I guess I would say. I have a question. Great. So in a dog's mind and in a dog's world, and how they communicate with one another, what I've experienced in the past, I've, I had a, a rat terrier that was the most innate and beautiful, um, benevolent leader. And so he always had a way of taking, having a benevolent authority over the other dogs in the home that was never, ever oppressive, but it was always, in fact, very balancing for my home. It didn't matter if I had one dog or five dogs, he kept a balance there. And he, I don't think, remember him ever growling, but there would be a way he would handle another dog that said, I am the leader. Mm -hmm. And um, other dogs, particularly insecure dogs, would take, they would take comfort from that and they would find more balance in themselves and they would find more um, security because of him. And so sometimes I wonder too, like if a, a dog that is more secure, is telling your more your less secure dog. I mean, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but sometimes I feel like dogs can help balance each other. It depends on the dog. It depends on um, the well, innate sense in that other the more secure dog, perhaps. But let's let's say it in a way that I'm more comfortable with, because okay. that's comfortable for you. But what I would say is instead. Um, <clears throat> Can a happy dog that feels mostly good about things and is getting along well in this environment influence other dogs that are struggling? Absolutely, dogs are very social creatures. Yeah. But I would, I would not be comfortable using any of the balanced leadership stuff because we don't have good evidence that that's what's going on. That's what humans see because that's how humans treat each other. But that's not how neutral observers in the field see what's happening. What we see is, is that these 
multiple social creatures are watching each other and learning from each other about what works. You call that leadership, that's cool. I don't think of it that way. But are they learning from each other all the time? Absolutely, definitely. They are a very social creature. Yes? What about humping? Because, now the reason I ask this, yes. we have breed rescue toxins. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Strangely enough, the second rescue was an eight-year-old who had had a horrible life. She's doing very well. Uh -huh. She's definitely the alpha. Even though she's the oldest over a four-year-old, and now we have a two-year-old that we've just had for a year. She would kick their butts. I mean, they know she's the alpha dog. She doesn't fight with them. But recently, Ridley keeps trying to hump her. And I thought it had to do with who wants to be the alpha dog. No? Nope. He's just horny? <laughs> I mean, he's neutered. Do any of you have any children? Yeah. Um, the last innate behaviors that we have are mostly considered vestigial. One good example is that if you place your finger in an infant's hand, they'll grip it tight enough that you can lift them up. Don't do it because it's dangerous. But there's plenty of videos on YouTube of people doing crazy stuff with humans because we have this thing. It goes away, I think, when we're around 10 months. When we do stuff like that, it feels really good. The last, and here I am breaking the rule, right? I'm gonna use a human example, but it makes it easier, easier for us to understand. It. The last one that we have that's useful is nursing. And it's defined like this. When we're born, we already know how to do it. We know how to do it really well. We wanna do it, and doing it feels good, whether or not we're successful. So even if we're not hungry, or even if we are hungry, if we suck on a pacifier for a while, what it does is, is, is it brings our stress level down, our joy level up, it relaxes us, and then, well, not us, but I assume it worked on me. Right? And that's what happens when these innate behaviors are performed. It makes, it makes the subject feel better. So there's a variety of reasons that dogs will mount and hump. The most common one, and my guess is from your description, of course, I'd want to see it and live in your house for a week and all this other stuff, right? Is that the dog is stressed out. The stress is coming from this dog. My guess is, is that the dog that's the growliest is actually the most nervous and most upset, right? They don't have any sort of built-in will to be in charge. They just aren't comfortable with what's going on. When you walk into the, anyway, so my guess is, is that the source of the stress is coming from this dog, and so the dog goes, what's the best way to calm myself down in this environment? Performing an innate behavior. Well, they play like crazy fun. Right, yeah. So, you know, I've never seen, I mean, she'll put him in his place if she, he goes too far. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, I'm tired now, but. Right. So, okay. that's my guess. Okay. There's a, there's a different category of behavior that we think of as being uh, predatory behavior. And if we were gonna say that we're talking about reactivity and aggression, which we've already said that we're not gonna use those magic words, um, this is its own category. Predatory behavior is considered normal in dogs, right? It doesn't mean that we have to accept it. I live with dogs and cats and there's squirrels in my yard and I can't have them hunting. But it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with a dog that wants to hunt, especially if it's a breed that's been bred to hunt or a breed like Rottweilers that are known for wanting to chase them. So it, like the nursing, like the humping, is, oh, by the way, back to the humping thing, you often see females do that too, right? It's, it's not, it's not yeah. sexual. That's the worst dog in my household is the female. Uh -huh. She likes to hump. Yep, it's just, a, it's, it, it is something that she has learned through history of consequence, makes her feel better. The problem is, is that the more they do some of these things, whether it's fetching or humping or marking, have you ever seen a male dog lift their leg, nothing comes out, and they scuff their back feet, and they're all like, yeah, that's great. They don't have to pee. But once that pattern is triggered, they'll do it unless it's interrupted. And this is the same. It doesn't have to be learned. It is self-reinforcing whether or not the target is caught. It doesn't matter if they catch the squirrel, they're more likely to chase them again if they try. 
In fact, some experiments suggest that it, they're more likely to chase them again, even if they can't try to chase, but if they experience the desire to chase. So they're on a leash, they can't actually do the chase thing, but they got to the end of the leash, now they're gonna to wanna to do it more next time. It is modifiable through history of reward and punishment, but it will always be there. Innate behaviors can't be permanently done away with. It'll all, that, that desire will always be there on some level and it can always come back. So it's something that if you wanna work on it, as I do, I kinda of work on it always. These used to be called fixed action patterns and we usually call them motor or modal action patterns now because they're not as fixed as we thought they were. And in fact, dogs are the species that taught us that A, they can be modified and B, and this is really important because the definition used to be that they were present the same in all members of the species. These dogs are weird, right? Some dogs will fetch till they drop and some dogs are like, eh. And that has to do with us breeding them in certain ways and kind of identifying things we wanted and breeding those more and identifying the things we didn't want and breeding those less. But that doesn't occur in wild animals that are uh, not, you know, they're, they're, they're breeding at whatever, for whatever reason the wild animals do, not the reason that dogs do. And so all members of those species still have those behaviors. I mean, this is really, a, I mean, for me, it's not a big deal. One of my dogs is a hunter. We go up in the woods and she doesn't have to eat for a couple days because she is very, very adept at her, mm -hmm. very. Adept, yes. Yeah, yes, at catching things, and right. bunnies and snakes. And, and she's actually eating them. Oh yeah, she eats the whole day. Yeah, right. Yeah, and I mean, at first it bothered me and now I'm like, I can't do anything about it. So, and I don't know if I want to, I have her off leash. I'm allowing her to do the wander because she's not aggressive, mm -hmm. except towards bunnies. <laughs> except towards what? Bunnies. bunnies. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I don't know your dog, and I don't know you, and I don't know where you live or what your life is like, so I don't want to address your situation specifically. Right. I mean, she's never attacked an animal that's not a wild animal. Uh-huh. And, and is not aggressive towards other dogs or cats. The important thing to understand is that the more that this behavior is done, uh -huh. the more likely it is to be done, and the more easily it is triggered. Right. So, I'll, I'll get to this in a second. So... When, you know, the Humane Society has a very progressive and effective approach to dogs that hurt other dogs. You know, there are some places where dogs never get a second chance. And the Humane Society does a really good job of saying, well, you're going to have to have your dog be under these rules from now on. And you're going to have to work with a qualified trainer to reduce the likelihood of this happening besides the management that we're going to require, which is fences and muzzles and leashes, etc. And as often as not, I, mean, I don't know how often it's not me, but I get sent on these a lot because they're required to hire somebody. And I'm one of the people they're allowed to hire for this. In my experience, and this is not universal, 100% of those dogs that have hurt other dogs badly where it was a smaller dog or a cat were allowed to hunt. Because what happens is they become more and more likely to be triggered and then the little critter runs by and the dog goes before they even identify species or anything like that. So if your lifestyle is one where that's okay, I, I, I think that's fine for the dog, you know, and for you. Um, I, it makes me worry in my own situation. That's all I'll say. Is that okay? Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> the answer to this and, and it's important to remember that it's it's not considered aggressive behavior. And one thing about it is that it's usually quiet, right? If the dog's allowed to do it, they're much more likely to be quiet about it than they are to be barking and growling. Yeah. Unless they're leashed or behind a fence and the critter runs by. And then they're suddenly stopped and their frustration explodes and then they look terribly aggressive or terribly frightening. In my experience, I think it looks very frightening. But really all they're doing is just trying, they're trying to stalk and they can't. Very frustrating. The answer to these are to reinforce different behaviors. And some of you might have come, I had a whole thing about reinforcing different behaviors and that's its own topic. But the, the, the short answer is, is that you can use distances as a modifier. So if the squirrel runs by right now, it might be a struggle, but we're pretty good across the room. You know what I mean? Like the further away you are, the better you are to work on it. And alternative behaviors would be things that take the place of the chase. 
So if you can get your dog to look back at you instead of staring at the squirrel, and then the reward is to chase the ball in the other direction, that's gonna take the place of chasing the squirrel. Theoretically, that's more effective than just feeding them food. Effective was the wrong word. It's, it, it fulfills in the dog this, this need that they were trying to fulfill themselves. By the way, <coughs> dogs that eat things they catch are relatively rare. That's not a very common thing. Um, I'm kind of interested in that. What kind of dog is it? It's uh, German Shorthair. Yeah, that's pretty unusual. Bad yeah. terriers. Yeah. What, what's that? Bad terriers are going to eat everything they catch. I mean, she like seriously eats the whole thing. Right, but you understand that both of those species were actually bred, bad terriers in particular, to not eat it. They were ready to catch it, shake it, drop it, and catch the next one. There's great videos of rat terriers working for a living on YouTube if you want to watch them. I watch many. Yeah. So anyway, they do take some training, but it's interesting that she's actually eating for a living. That's that's unusual. Um, the premac principle is when you allow them to do something that they want to do after they do the thing that they kind of don't want to do. That's a very quick answer to it, but. The reason I say be careful of that is that one common recommendation that I recommend strongly against is, is that if your dog will not chase and will look at you and pay attention and walk by, then after that you can go and let them chase. So that they learn that impulse control thing and it, 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 it can work very well. The problem is, is the chase is self-reinforcing and so every time that you do that, the dog wants to do it more. And it can come back and get you. And it can also be just fine, it, you know, all of these things most things in dog training usually work. It's, it's what I'm looking for is what always works. So what we want to do is work for the different behavior. And to practice that, um, I always want to be doing it on purpose as opposed to by accident. So that when it happens by accident, so those two pictures were by accident, but this is us practicing with intent. Can you see the little squirrels moving around over there? Right, so we like to go here. On your little piece of paper there that I gave you, it says dogs are crepuscular. It means their natural waking hours are morning and evening. They're awake three or four hours in the morning and three or four hours in the evening. That's true of all canids, and it's usually true of their prey too. So if you want to find ground squirrels in the woods, you go you know around doggy dinner time, right? That's when the dog's most alert and active, and that's when you're most likely to find their prey. So we go and we practice doing this. I don't know if you can see the little squirrel there, but he's staring right at it. So you practice without distractions before you see the critters, and when you're really good at seeing other stuff that's not critters, then you introduce the critters and you reward them for something different. I've chosen holding still, but it could be something else. There's a bunny. There's a chicken. <laughs> There's a squirrel. We do this a lot, right? And those three by accident. Those, those weren't things that we expected to see, but we're good enough at it that when we see them, he looks at me and says, is this the time that I get a cookie? And I say, yes it is. Stay right there while I get out my camera. <laughs> Take the picture and then you can get the cookie. Any questions about that? So is he at the point where as soon as he sees a squirrel, he just stays still and waits for you? Um, what he'll usually do is look at me. But that is very dependent upon what else is going on. Come on over here, bud. Come lay down. That's very dependent upon what else is going on and how close they are and everything else. But he's never actually chased one that I can remember. Well, when I first had him, he'd be interested in, you know, you think about it. But we live with two cats and little dogs, right? And I can't have him chasing critters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Going back to you, just the innate behaviors you mentioned, yes. like the more they mark, the more satisfying it is, unless you interrupt it. So are there certain behaviors that you want to interrupt so that they don't? Um, well, what I meant to say, and I'm sorry if I didn't say it very well, is that these behaviors are self-rewarding, and what that means is that it feels good enough to do it that you don't have to reward it other than that. And almost all of them, I would say, are reasonably healthy, and I try to allow them within reason. And so, 
Um, I have, I didn't bring any of it, but I have a hilarious video of my bull mastiff and my rat terrier taking turns humping each other. And you know, they're both <laughs> neutered males, adults, and they don't take turns at this, they, they're both past, but they didn't take turns at the same time, but Frankie gets stressed out and go after Iggy's leg and look back and look, whatever and walk away. And other times, <laughs> Iggy, Frankie be laying there, Iggy gets stressed out and reach over this paw and drag him under it, you know? And, um, <laughs> I mean, it's funny, it, it's certainly not something that I would allow to go on if, I always, I don't want them to be stressed in the first place, so I prefer that just not come up, but it's harmless, it's a little bit, and I didn't worry too much about it, never caused any, they didn't do it to anybody else, so that's a little thing. Marking is something that I, I can't have them doing it in the house, so we have to manage it and make sure that they get rewarded for it out there, which they don't have to re be rewarded for it other than just letting them do it, you know what I mean? But. I'm just thinking we have a lot of dogs here that mark like every few feet. And I encourage people to let them do that to an extent. And usually I'll let them do that in the beginning of the walk and the end of the walk so they can get a little bit of it done. Be ready to go out and have a good time. And then at the end, your reward is you can be on everything. For dogs here, my opinion is I would just let them do it. I wouldn't even try to walk them. Just let them be. You can't possibly walk a dog in this situation enough to have a serious impact on their need for a physical exercise. It's right. just mental. Yeah. So leash or fence reactivity. Um, this can be fearfulness, but it's usually frustration. The dog wants to do something that they're not allowed to do and they don't understand it. And they don't have enough training to do something different. And this is really important to understand. Most leash reactivity, I hear this all the time. My dog does fine at daycare. My dog does fine at the dog park. But on leash, she barks and lunges. Any of you experience this or hear this, right? Okay, so what is happening? Well, playing with other dogs is a self-rewarding behavior. They don't need to be rewarded by you, right? Would your dog keep playing if you don't walk up and feed him every five minutes? Of course, just play. So their history of reward for playing with other dogs is way stronger than their history of reward for walking on a loose leash. In any given environment, under any given circumstance, under that environment, the most likely behavior for any animal is whatever has the strongest history of reinforcement. So what happens is, is dogs don't have enough training to compete with the training that they're receiving at dog parks and daycare. And then you take them on leash and the dog's like, I'm gonna play with that dog like I always do. I can't, what the hell? I can't, what the hell? No, I'm pissed. Right? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. No. Too good. I'm too good an actor. So what happens in what ha what what ends up happening then is is that the dog is frustrated and doesn't understand. Remember, this is the dog that can't see themselves in the mirror, that doesn't recognize themselves on television. They don't understand what the leash or the fence is. They just are being blocked and they're having a meltdown like a toddler. Any questions about that? Over here, Rudy. Well, that's fine. It, that is not by the that is not by the way a very popular idea that I just said but I think there's really good science behind it because it doesn't mean to not take your dog to dog parks and it doesn't mean that daycare can't be great it means that the more that they experience those environments the more you have to do your training, your due diligence of training, so that when they see dogs in the distance or whatever, that they don't just go, ah! Over time, they can actually become afraid, especially if their only interactions that are positive with dogs are at a daycare. And every time that there's someplace else, their interactions with dogs are terrible for them because they're frustrated and too often punished by their handler. So then they're like, Anywhere with daycare, dogs means I get pronged. <laughs> so I hate other dogs. Get away from me, you other dog. And we'll, we'll look at more of that in a minute. Trigger stacking is just the simple idea that dogs can have bad days or bad weeks or whatever, and it often seems like things are unpredictable. Like I said, if terrible things have happened to Rudy yesterday or today, I wouldn't have brought him now. Because sometimes they can experience one of these triggers or two of these triggers and everything's fine, but it's not about the nature of the trigger, it's how many of these triggers have they experienced in that time period. Go ahead. Is this related back to the leash uh, mm -hmm. aggression? Okay. 
because that's mainly why we're here and I wanted to sure about because that. sometimes it seems like gosh I really thought I had solved this problem of my dog being upset about passing bicycles but he just barked and lunged at a bicycle but you look back at your day or your two days and you realize well we saw four dogs three motorcycles and the bicycle was the last thing and they lunged and that's because their triggers have been stacked and stacked and stacked and stacked that happened that to me yesterday sense. in our parking lot. There were everybody was enjoying the sunshine. There were more people out. It was more yes. comfortable. There were kids coming up from yes. behind. <laughs> yep. So and yeah. any one of those things, you know, one kid or one whatever, but it's all of that combined. It's just overwhelming. So it goes back to that uh, concept that we introduced in the beginning of flooding. Um, the difference being that the flooding is instead of happening all at once, it's happening gradually, but the dog is still being overwhelmed by these triggers. So it can be frustration and arousal related like ongoing rough play or targets for chase. It's not necessarily something bad. It can be something that would be good, would they be allowed to do it? I often think of uh, human examples, I can't really help myself, but if any of you are old enough to remember the battles between the Celtics and the Lakers in the 80s, those guys were somewhat friendly most of the time. They were mostly really good ball players, and there was this one really famous fight between Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, and afterwards I remember them asking, what was that about? They're like, I had no idea. You know, they're just completely over-aroused in the moment, and your normal stuff goes away. It's the same, it's similar for dogs. When reactions are stifled or redirected or still triggers, you gotta realize even if you can get the dog to not do the thing that they wanna do, they're still being triggered by it and that trigger stacking is still occurring. So, you know, Rudy and I do a pretty good job in a lot of places, but I don't necessarily, for instance, we often speak at um, Seat Home High School and that building, it just changed, right? They tore down the old building, they're tearing down the old building or whatever, and there's a new building and we went there and I was like, whoa, I forgot about that, it's a whole new thing whole new place and we had to walk down the hall it's like okay that'll be okay but after that event it was, a, it was all fine we went straight home and we didn't really do anything for two days just to let them chill out hmm. but it can often be fear related which is noises perceived threats uh, compulsion training and resource issues etc whatever it is that's causing them to be afraid is still a trigger that's stacking and it can be both and it often is the cat that runs by, the squirrel that runs by, the skateboard that goes by, the big truck, and then the firework. Well, which one of those things were they afraid of and which one were they aroused by? Some of them are obvious. They were afraid of the motorcycle and aroused by the cat. But I don't really know about the truck or the motorcycle. Did they want to chase it for fun or were they afraid of it? I don't know. It doesn't really matter. It's still a trigger. Motorcycles are a weird one. I, I'm often not sure about them. So this is Rudy when he was rescued by the Humane Society. Oh my. Um, and I don't mean to share the picture for the shock value. I'm just kind of trying to explain some of the things that we've learned together, right? So you can see he was chained his whole life. So when you go back to the beginning about exposures and appropriate socialization, zero, right? He missed all of those windows because he didn't end up here until he was almost a year. So. At first, I was trying to keep a log of all the things that he was afraid of. <laughs> then I just was afraid of everything. Mm -hmm. Tossed the log, right? But um, people of color, I, he'd obviously never seen a person of color and he saw one and I was like, did some African-American person beat you with a bicycle who was overweight? <laughs> it's just things he hadn't experienced that he was afraid of. It wasn't that somebody that looked like that had done these things with those things. It's just bicycles are weird. Skateboards are weird. Uh, motorcycles, trucks, television, loud noises, children, wheelchairs, fireworks, getting in the car, getting out of the, like I said, everything is a scary thing. And if you've never house trained an adult dog who weighs 100 pounds, it's, it's an experience I recommend for everybody. <laughs> it keeps you honest real quick. Um, but the television terrified him, and so did the whole world. I've never seen a dog that didn't want to leave the show. Like, you try to get him, no, he just wants to get back. And I have a theory, excuse me. I have lots of theories, but they're just theories, so who cares? So here he is biting me. And, um, you know, yep. being a professional dog trainer, I'm not necessarily proud of this. In fact, I'm not <laughs> proud of it at all, but I am proud of my ability to learn from mistakes. So I was trying really hard to sort of, you know, 
post-socialization window, socialize them and get them out in the world too much. We were too far from home. He started to get riled up. We couldn't get home fast enough. Too many things that occurred, too many stuff. And there were a bunch of homeless people living down here that were making a bunch of weird noise, one of which was, hey, nice dog, woof, 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 woof. And that was the final thing, right? Oh, so he just, he's just letting it out. Well, there's hope then. Well, there's big hope. <laughs> he hasn't done that in a while. You know what I mean? How did you get the camera? What's that? How did you get the camera to capture that? Well, my wife was videoing us because I was trying to demonstrate something unrelated to this, and that's part of the problem, right? Is I wasn't thinking about his feelings enough. I was thinking about, watch how good I am in teaching this dog to heal. Hmm. Watch me being an idiot and getting <laughs> a very predictable outcome. So um, the reason that this was such a big deal, count them, right? But one of them was is that once this occurs, all kinds of things are off the table for him forever. He can never be a reading program dog. He can never be a therapy dog. You know, all those things done. That's it. Big mistake. And the mistake I want to be clear about was not that I was training him badly or doing, well, I was training him badly in that I hadn't accounted for his emotional condition. I hadn't accounted for his level of arousal or where he was at. He was both aroused and afraid. He just let go. You cried. You know, at that moment, well, what would you cried. What would you do now? If he, he was well, what would I do now is I wouldn't be there, but in the moment I didn't do anything. I actually, and I'm sure this sounds weird, but I took food and I threw it on the ground and let him eat it because I needed him to do something else immediately. And that's not the kind of thing where he's in any danger of being rewarded for biting a person because it was once. You know, when you train bite work, and I don't have any expertise in training bite work, but I've, you know, I've read about it, I've seen it, and it, it takes off. Just like anything, being rewarded for something once is not really that big a fear, but I needed him to immediately feel better and do something different. So, and did plus, he, I needed time to gather myself, because I was really upset. When he was so stressed like that, would he actually eat it? Yes, and that's a really good question. That Thank surprised you. So, me, too. Yeah, there are times when he won't eat, right? But... See, the problem is, is that in that instance, I don't really know exactly, physiologically, I can't possibly know all the things that were going on, but I think that the, the explosion released all this tension, and then he could eat, probably if I had tried to feed him the moment before, but I have to admit, that was six years ago, and I don't remember all the details of the event. Most of what I share here, we have good peer-reviewed studies about. There's been tons of peer-reviewed studies about what happens when you train this dog and that dog, and we, we know this stuff for sure. This is just a theory, okay? I don't know about this for sure. But it's a good theory that matches my own experience and matches enough dog trainers' experience that we think it's true, but it's hard to test. Um, it takes dogs way longer to calm down. That we're pretty sure about, but exactly how long? To be really safe, a lot of people recommend three days. If there's a big event, three days. I, I can't always match that, but I certainly go for two. Well, that's uh, good information because I've never heard that before. Worth the price of admission, huh? <laughs> um, there's a very famous dog trainer, Diane Garab. She's actually, I, I followed her and took a class online from her and didn't even realize that she's based on Whidbey Island. So that was pretty exciting. I was like, what, what? But anyway, um, this was something that she has made relatively well known. She has a program that she calls the Emotional Detox. So when she's working with dogs that have these issues, the first thing that she does is nothing interesting for three days. Let's just start at, let's try to get back to zero. Let's try to start at a place that's relatively calm. Yes? What if you can't? Like right now, my dog has a hard time with contractors. This, he's a nine month old puppy and we've been um, building our house since before we even got him. So he's yeah. been around him and he's close his whole life. Had a great time in the beginning, but recently contractors just, I mean, he becomes Cujo in the house and I can't like say, hey, we're not doing drywall anymore. Just right. because, and I can't really go anywhere else because I need to be home with sure. the contractors in the house. So all week long, he's got contractors and then he's exhausted on the weekends. But I don't, I, but then it starts back up on Mondays. I, I always want to give you solutions and not just add to the problem. I also right. realize that not knowing everything there is about your situation, that some of my solutions may not be effective. But what I tend to think about is, 
make sure to grab one of those rack cards is, is that lately it hasn't been the case because he's a little overweight, so I'm really trying to manage his weight. But for the first couple of years I had Rudy, what I recommend for everybody is that the meals should take 90 minutes to two hours for a dog like this. So you can't start there, but you can build up with, you know, the classic is it starts off with a Kong that's easy to get the food out of, and then it's a Kong that's been stuffed well. And then it's a Kong where you've actually added twice as much volume by adding fiber and moisture, so now it's two Kongs stuffed well. And when that goes well, then you freeze them solid. And so for, for a long time, many years, most of his meals were in my office with the door closed with a Kong going, good luck, buddy. <laughs> or two Kongs, if I had a long day at work, I'd give him two in a crate that was covered. And here's the big one with a noise machine or YouTube on a background white noise channel. So imagine if you can setting off his life so that there are contractors there, but he doesn't even think about it or know it. That's what I'd be looking for. And it will help you to help him if instead of thinking about it in terms of contractors, what is it specifically? Is it the noises they make? It's the stranger are they, aspect. I'm sorry? It's stranger. He's he always barks when anything. Because if it's only strangers, then you can fix that by making them not be strangers. You know what I mean? But it's like it's more than that, isn't it? Because it it's going to happen again. And he's, in his, and he's in a period of, of his life in which this is the classic one where he's learning what to be afraid of and what not to be Critical afraid of. Critical thinking. Yeah. I've experienced it a lot with him. Yeah. That's a tough age. Tough age I'm, you're in there. It's just, I mean, he's almost nine months now. But mm -hmm. like, this is, we, had, we started construction before we got him. I, I understand. I'm not saying that you should stop working on your house. I'm saying that what right. you can do to manage it is good. Right. And we'll see a video in a minute here that might give you some other ideas. But the main thing about this is management. I mean, if you can create, I always like to think about it in terms of just a safe space for them where they can go and be and be entertained and not experience these triggers that you can't possibly condition. Um, Fearfulness outline, first and foremost, keep the dog under threshold feeling safe, right? Which you're not able to do, and that's what I'm saying is you start with figuring out how to do that. There's some way that you can do it. I hope. Because yeah, I mean, everything else depends part, on like, We just sit in the bedroom together all day long, but then that's really tough. Like. <laughs> yeah, well, work it out so he can be in there by himself and make it so he can't hear the triggers outside. Yeah. Okay. We want to desensitize and counter condition to triggers kind of the same thing, creating new emotional reactions. So what that means is, is that the trigger arrives and something else really good occurs. It's Pavlovian conditioning. And over time, the quality of the one thing takes on the quality of the other. So that over time, those things are not as scary. Use positive reinforcement to teach new and desired behaviors and recognize that really most of the time we're doing all three of these at the same time. We're keeping the dog feeling safe enough that they can learn productively, they're having good experiences with things because of the association that's happening, and they're learning new behaviors all at once. You really can't divorce these two. They'll always be learning both at the same time, always. I really do wanna be helpful with your dog and the contractors. I just don't, like, you've gotta start with how can you set up your life so that they're not experiencing these triggers all the time, and then reintroduce the triggers by making positive associations. Usually if the dog is afraid and there isn't a resource, this is important because if there's a resource, they will not act this way. But if there's not a resource, if it's simple fearfulness, evolutionary biology says the animal will appease or leave. That's true for herbivores and carnivores. Horse people always go, oh, they're a prey animal. It's not really relevant. It's, it really has nothing to do with it. Animals that are afraid will either leave or appease. Unless they can't, or there's a resource that they can't give up biologically. Do you mean a piece like the other dog or a Or you, or? sure, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they don't know they're doing it, we don't think. I mean, they don't necessarily, it, it's the, you know, I've seen this happen on video and I've seen it happen in real life where a person will approach a dog and they're rolling their back and pee, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. These are appeasement behaviors and what they're saying is, I'm so freaking scared right now, just please go away. It's an appeasement behavior that you often see adult dogs, and I wish I had this on video because it happened to Rudy once, where he ran at a dog, it was a yellow lab, and his best friend was a yellow lab, and I kind of think he just was excited and didn't realize it wasn't her, I don't know for sure, but he charged right at this poor dog, and the dog went, ah, and peed, and Rudy stopped and went, what the hell is happening, you know? <laughs> it's not that he's ever been trained to stop and do that, this is just dog body language that 
I, I don't pretend to understand all of it or understand necessarily how they interpret it, but you see it all the time. So appeasement gestures um, are, you know, these are just some classic ones, right? They'll tuck their tail, they'll cower, their ears will roll back, these kind of things, right? And sometimes you see this with other dogs. It breaks my heart to see it with people. Um, that, that it, sometimes that means lack of experience. It usually means bad experience. But the other one is, and this is important because fearful aggression is one of those target things that we really have to realize that what has really happened is, is if they could escape, they would have. But if they experience this a few times where they try to escape and can't, they'll stop trying that. And this is too often where leash aggression or leash reactivity or whatever we want to call this stuff has become fearfulness. They've tried to do something and it hasn't worked enough times that now when they get cornered, they don't even try cowering. They just go right to attack or not attack, but air snap or whatever. They, they do these displays that are called distance seeking behaviors. And even if the dog runs at the other dog or the person, if the person leaves, they'll usually, usually stop and go, okay. That is not always true, but that's what we're going for. Whatever visible display the dog presents, whether it's cowering or lunging, barking, any of it, um, their involuntary stuff is going to be the same. And I really like this chart. I didn't make this. I found it this way. And they intentionally did this to demonstrate that our reactions that are happening beneath the surface are the same across multiple species. That we can teach them to not growl or bark. But they'll still get tunnel vision, dry mouth, muscle tension, tightness in chest, their paws will sweat, they'll pee. Uh, they'll become dizzy, their skin will become, it's really weird to see a light colored dog to see them get upset and see their skin go uh, red. Difficulty breathing, butterflies in the stomach, heart rate goes up, blood pressure, goes, all of those things are still going to occur even if you've trained them not to emote, not to display their emotions. And that's why I'm as interested in the other as I am in this. So the physiological response to trauma is, you know, all those things we just said. There's some funny, I mean, there's this is one of those things where I almost don't want to share with people what you're really seeing in videos because there's nothing you can do about it now. But if, like me, you spend too much time on Facebook and my whole feed is just dog stuff and then people send it to me, I'm like, I don't want to bum you out. That's just, it looks funny, but it's actually heartbreaking, you know, when you see the dog, see the thing that you're like, oh, that's just a cucumber. They can't possibly be scared. They just tip over. I mean, they've fainted in fear and we laugh. Uh, this was something that I set up in my car for Rudy to help him um, not react out the window. So this is a funnel and a tube that bends and a little thing. So we would drive in the car and whenever he would see anything that I thought he might be scared of, dog treats out of the little cup into the funnel. And so I was both conditioning his emotional reactions and teaching him that when weird stuff happened to come to the middle of the car, not the edges. Worked great. We can go through drive throughs now. We can do the drive through coffee and bank. And it used to be that we couldn't even drive down the street. He was just at the window looking at everything exploding. What is CC slash DS? Uh, that is counter conditioning desensitization. So that is the process of, you know, you remove the triggers and then slowly reintroduce them while pairing them with things that are good. I get that this is insane. You know, most people don't, can't, they can't possibly do this. Uh, a friend of mine uh, online, I have all these friends, trainers on Facebook now, I think of them as good friends, but I should never meet them. Um, you know, she was like, you should patent that and develop it and mark it. I was like, how the hell would you, like, what is there? It's just a thing, you know, like, what would you sell? I don't know, but I was flattered that she thought that. The first thing I like to do is have all of the dogs and all of the people meet each other without the two dogs being there. So one dog waits in the other room or in the car. Allowing the dogs to greet the humans. And they all greet. Greatly reduce potential. Right? That way I'm not a trigger when Rudy's in the room. So that right there reduces all the tension. Not all, but some of the tension. Handlers should only feed their own dogs. Next is, you should be feeding your dog, but nobody else should. Okay? Just the meeting or... Well, in any time there's any kind of stress or fear, it's never a good idea if your dog's afraid of somebody, don't give food to that person and then have them feed the dog. Oh, okay. That, that could backfire badly. 
it's the right idea that we're trying to pair those two things. We're trying to pair the joy of the food with the source of the fear, but it should be like what we did with Pippa. We're at a distance and I'm feeding the dog or you're feeding the dog, not the person that's scary. Rudy is a little bit afraid of all of you. I'm not going to ask you to come close enough to feed him. We're fine, I promise. He's not that afraid. Okay, so at this point, the humans have met the dogs independently, so we're not such a... Amber's not a big deal to Rudy. He's already snuggled with her 20 minutes ago or something. At a distance where the dogs can see each other but are still able to focus on their handlers, do a few tricks, place them, find it, let the dogs ease in to paying attention. So we're on opposite ends of the room and we're just doing sits and downs and spins or just basic tricks and getting food rewards so that, you know, we're confident that they're able to listen and pay attention. Dog and then it's something else or you. If they're panicked, they can't. A really good indication for Rudy is will he take food, but a better one is will he sit or lay down? And if he won't, then I'm worried. If he will, he did everything I asked him, I'm like, I'm not. But if his emotional arousal level is, emotion or arousal level is all the way up here, either because he's afraid or excited, yeah. and he can't listen at all, we've got to fix that before we can let him eat, right? And it right. sounds like that's what happened with your dog, was this is, his or her arousal level is off the charts and they met anyway, yes. and then you have no control, right? So this whole process, you know, it's edited down, obviously, and but I think it took 10 minutes or something to reinforce that. We don't want them over-focusing on the other dog. So all I was saying is they look at the dog and they look at something else, anything. Reinforce that. I'm not saying don't look at the dog, I'm saying Allow the them. dogs to look at each other, then use games, tricks, or cue behaviors to redirect their concentration back to you or other features of their environment. That's my video voice. <laughs> <laughs> Does this make sense what we're doing? We're yes. getting closer and closer. I love it. We're having a good time. Everybody's having fun. I think I was having fun. Um, <laughs> what you just described, but you didn't say it in those words. Is first you're looking at the emotion, then you're looking at the behavior. Always. Okay. You bet. Yeah. Yes, that makes so sense. Yeah. Now, her dog's name is Jude, and he was a lot. This was like a year ago. They had met once or twice before when Jude was a little puppy, but now Jude is an adolescent, more or less adult. That's a different thing, right? So we used to, it was an opportunity to make a video, but I was also, I wanted to be cautious because Rudy can be grumpy, you know? Um, so we're 10 feet or so from each other. The dogs are fairly relaxed. They're still cueable. That means they'll still do what we ask. And neither dog is lunging or pulling uncontrollably. I think you saw that part, right? They're not out of control. Um, and only now am I gonna remove, I'm gonna move Rudy's leash to his back so he can drag it for safety so I can always grab him and pull him away, but it's, it's just there for safety. I'm not. You're now ten or so feet from each bit. other, and both dogs are fairly relaxed. They are still cueable, and neither dog is lunging or pulling uncontrollably. Only now will I move Rudy's leash to his back. He will drag it for safety at first, and then release him. So we were talking earlier about appeasing gestures. See what Jude's doing here? Making himself smaller and looking and away. Responded by stopping. There's his appeasement gesture. After a few seconds, Rudy <laughs> stopped. No problem recalling to me. Good interaction. So it's not that it's something bad that Jude got scared. Rudy's huge, you know. Jude went like this. Rudy backed off and then listened to me when I called him, as you saw in the video, right? So we're like, okay, this is fine. They're communicating. I'm sorry that your dog got scared, but it's not the end of the game yet. We're still doing well, actually. Um, and Rudy learned something which was wow I can't really play rough with this guy at all because he won't he won't play with me if I do that and he wants to play <laughs> So we should have already removed Both the dogs are loose yeah. and bouncy in their movements. They're taking turns chasing and being chased. This is appropriate play <laughs> The turn taking is critical right that you know if they're playing they'll take turns doing things and as you can see Rudy's still Doing what I ask. Dogs are taking turns, they are listening to us, and they are responding to each other's body language. After checking with the other handler, we are ready to remove leashes. Oh, good boy. Nice boy. Good dog. I like to do a rewarded trick and a clear release after the leash comes off. I really don't want the leash to have any meaning. It is there only as a backup plan in case something unforeseen occurs. 
Good dog training, the leash isn't a training tool, right? It's there in case your training's not working out so they don't run at the dog or run into the street or something. Um, but what we're doing there, we took longer than we had to, but I think the whole thing was 15 minutes. Hmm. It was like, I don't even like dogs. Why are you talking about dogs to me? He's a wolf <laughs> biologist, you know? But people grasped what he said and they just wouldn't let it go because it's so sexy, isn't it? Isn't that sexy, the idea that I am his leader? No, it's not. Uh, yes, I love that idea. <laughs> but that's in my head, not in his. <laughs> in his head, it's like, where's... Where would you use instead of leader, pack leader, or whatever? I just try to think that way. No, <laughs> how do you relate it in your mind? Like, how do you relate, in your mind, how do you relate to him? Well, in the moment that he bit me, <laughs> it's very different. But um, I, I guess if you, if you think about it, when we use terminology like that, we're making analogies between humans and dogs, right? So again, this is a species that doesn't recognize themselves in mirrors, doesn't understand when they pass their own gas. They, they will lick themselves to the bone because they don't realize that the pain that they're feeling is being caused by themselves. They don't sit there and reflect about, gosh, my relationship with Michael, you know, puts me in these disease. Your dogs. So I really try to just think about it as uh, what we do, not what we are. So I try to take good care of him. I try to keep him out of danger. I try to not put him in situations in which his reactions will get either one of us arrested or <laughs> arrested here or downtown. Um, I try to give him high quality food as much as I can afford or provide, um, give him the right stuff. So if you take all of that stuff together, I guess I'm his parent. <laughs>